My show and tell is much smaller than sometimes they are, but at least there's something I'm showing you, right? I'm not just going to talk to you today. So I have right here a little tub of a salve, like a little cream, that is made by the Women's Collective in San Isidro, our partner community in El Salvador. And, woo! And they make these little creams, so it's just a little tub, and inside there is goo. Forgot this one was green, that's fun. Um, so there's this green goo inside, as you can tell from the label. Um, and they make these with natural ingredients from right around them. Um, and this one is used to treat bug bites. So if you get a bug bite, you can rub this on there, and it'll help that itchy, stingy feeling go away. Um, there's also one for sore joints, y'all. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so you might, you might know, you might not know. Our friends in San Isidro in El Salvador, they have very little money. And um, so they grow food that is just enough for their family to eat and save some seed for next year. Um, and, but there are not a lot of jobs uh, that pay enough money to um, really sort of improve things. And so the women in San Isidro said, hey, you know what we could do? We could make some ointments and put them in little jars and sell them so that we can make a little bit of extra money. Um, We're about to hear a story about some women who step up and make the world a better place, and I just want you to know that right now, today, there are still women stepping up and making the world a better place, even when it seems like there are not a lot of opportunities. So, um, today's story is going to begin the next book of the Bible after the story that we read last week. So we've just spent some time with Joseph and his brothers, and his brothers came down to Egypt and, and got food, and then they were in Egypt, and that was great for a while. While Joseph was alive, the people of Israel were honored guests in, in Egypt. But now the story picks up a few hundred years later than that, so Joseph is gone, and his brothers are all gone, and now the people are going to lose their freedom, except for a few women who are free in a whole different way. So, we're going to listen to some awesome women in this story. Are you ready? I hope you're ready. I'm ready. Are you ready? Okay. Sally, are you ready? Okay, our prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from Exodus 1, verses 8 through 22. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppose them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Fittim and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of name Shepra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? 
the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded as his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. The word of the Lord. Once upon a time, I was a volunteer chaplain at uh, my local hospital. Uh, we were about an hour away from the nearest big hospital by ambulance. Uh, and so that meant that we had, we always had, you know, a decent uh, number of patients uh, in the hospital, um, but we were too small uh, to have like a full-time staff chaplain. So uh, pastors in the community uh, served in rotations as chaplain, and so we would every day go through and visit every, uh, every patient, at least newly admitted, and some who would, if they'd been there for a while and so forth, and offer spiritual support. Uh, chaplains have a code of ethics, so that we know, for instance, our role is not to convert the patients to uh, our denomination or our religion. We are just there to offer support and care. I would say that the local chaplains, volunteer, or local pastors volunteering as chaplains uh, were sort of variable in their practice of those and other boundaries around uh, the chaplain role. But um, the chaplains were part of the care team there at the hospital, which meant that we had access to any patient room as was needed by the patient, except in the mother-child health unit. In the mother-child health unit, the maternity unit, I don't know if this hospital still has a maternity unit anymore. We're only an hour away from the big hospital. We had to ask first before we went anywhere inside that unit. Now, all nurses that I know are highly protective of their patients. But OB nurses are a whole different category of protective of their patients. You cross an OB nurse and she will end you. <laughs> that was like, that was the first thing we learned. It was like, wash your hands and don't mess with maternity, right? Because caring for children is this special responsibility that brings with it a special kind of power, as we saw with these Hebrew midwives in the first part of today's reading. We will see some of that same care and power in this scripture lesson I'm about to read, too. Those midwives, Shifra and Puah, they had the power to stand up to the most powerful human being any of them would ever meet and give him that laughable line about, well, we can't possibly kill all the male children because our women are too strong and they give birth before we have a chance. I picture them like spitting on the floor before they answer Pharaoh, right? This is, this is just... The, the authority that these women possess, not because they have any kind of structural power, right? But because they are filled with the spirit of compassion for the women and the children that they care for. They are the freest people in the land of Egypt. Their clarity about what matters and about what who matters is good news because the Bible tells us that that royal power always leads to oppression, and it is the freedom from that power that leads the people into freedom. So like I said, we're going to meet a few more of these women in this uh, scripture lesson. This is from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. 
the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister, uh, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. This too is the word of the Lord. So it is a good thing that all of these women stood up to Pharaoh's power in order to save the life of our main character, whom we have just met. It's an underuse of heroic women, if you ask me. The story could have been a lot shorter. We're beginning seven weeks of reading through the book of Exodus today. This is the story of God setting the people of Israel free from slavery in the land of Egypt. And this story, this story of Exodus, is going to teach us how to read the Gospels. We're going to start reading Matthew's Gospel a little bit later in December, but in the fall, we always read stories from the Old Testament in order to tell us how to understand that whole great big story of salvation. And this year, our stories from the Old Testament include this kind of mother of all stories. Exodus is the story that gives its shape to all four of the Gospels that we read from the New Testament. Jesus' life reads like it is scenes from the Exodus story. So the Christmas story sounds like this birth of Moses that we just read, and the Sermon on the Mount sounds like the Ten Commandments being given at Mount Sinai, and the feeding of the 5,000 sounds like the manna in the wilderness. And most of all, Jesus' death sounds like the Passover lamb that we're going to find out about in a couple of weeks. We're going to read all of those different stories from the book of Exodus, and that's part of how the gospel stories should make sense to us. Now, if that idea of the gospels and the book of Exodus, if that's new to you, that's okay. It was new to me, too. But when you look at the way that the gospel is built on top of this story from Exodus, you start to see the way that the gospel is about God's sovereign action to set humanity free. God's sovereign action to set humanity free, to set us free from sinful powers of poverty and hunger and political oppression, to set us free from chattel slavery as the first hymn we sang together reminds us. You may know that um, the Bibles that were provided to enslaved people so that they could be formed into good Christians often had the book of Exodus actually removed. It's that dangerous a story. And yes, God's sovereign action to set us free from death that ultimately holds us captive here. This is a story about God's sovereign action to set us free. Now, the gospel, yes, we also point out is, is the story of God's action to free us from sin. But in order to make sense of the gospels, you have to understand the word free is a lot bigger letters than the word sin, or at least according to our contemporary understanding of sin. But this is not a sermon about sin today. This is a story about God's sovereign action to set us free. Exodus is about a God who hears the cry of an oppressed people and acts in sovereign love to save them. What is sovereign in this story? Pharaoh thought it was him. What is sovereign in this story is love. And then we get six more weeks. God is going to have to form this people into a people who are ready for the freedom that God is leading them out into. And in every story, this uh, this week's and every story, we're going to see God just tirelessly at work 
to set the people free, and the people stubbornly being taught how to trust and obey the God who is setting them free. It'll do us some good to learn from those same stories, how we can live into that freedom that builds God's future in our world today. And today's step in the story is those women showing us how to exercise God's sovereign power by resisting the way things are, by resisting the one who claims that power for himself, by showing the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, that even he cannot resist the compassion of God expressed in the freedom of these women. This Thursday evening, a few days ago, we heard from Carmen Elena Diaz Ansaro, a Presbyterian peacemaker uh, who is working in El Salvador with that same power to make the world new. She works in El Salvador with returned migrants uh, who have traveled north but have come back to San Salvador uh, where she works. Now, migrants leave El Salvador for all kinds of reasons, basically poverty, climate change, natural disasters, gang violence, and the root causes of a lot of those different reasons are rooted in policies that the United States has enacted and taken action for to try to control El Salvador during the 20th century. That's colonization by another name. And as Carmen explained to us, the, the government of El Salvador doesn't have a particularly strong uh, incentive to try to control that out-migration because remittances, money sent back by those migrants working in the United States, make up about 24% of El Salvador's GDP. So these returning migrants, they've come home either voluntarily after the time that they have spent in the United States or they've been deported, which is the final link in that long chain of those policy choices made by United States governments through the years and through the lives of these migrants. But they often return with very little. They've sent a lot back, hopefully, but they return with very little. And deportees in particular have nothing. And their families often can't support them and they are effectively abandoned there on the streets of San Salvador. And what's more, gangs often control access to many of the neighborhoods in San Salvador and other major cities. That is far less the case in the mountains around Berlin, uh, where our community of, of San Isidro is located. But Carmen works with her church, the Reformed Calvinist Church of El Salvador. She works to create contexts where people can be free from that gang rivalry, from the pressures of that violence that seeks to control their lives and their livelihoods. And she teaches conflict transformation. And she offers a space where people have the support to learn how to love each other without violence, to work together free from those structures of oppression. Her church works, as our church does, to address the underlying causes of that conflict, both between people and in the economics of everyday life. And it's slow and it's delicate work. As those of you who were here on Thursday saw, Carmen is deeply gifted for this work. And most of all, she is driven by that compassion that resists the structures of violence, that chooses not to participate in the structures of violence, and in that way is more free, is more free than anyone can try to bind. So Carmen doesn't wield a whole lot of worldly power in the way that we think about it. Most peacemakers don't wield a whole lot of power in the way that the world thinks about it. What they depend on is the power of God, the compassion of God, that empowers them to act in love. And compassion doesn't care how powerful Pharaoh is, or how violent the gang is, or how ruthless the world around us may be. Compassion is perfectly free to love and to care for the vulnerable right here in front of us. 
That's sovereign love. That is the freedom that we celebrate right here at this table, and that is the freedom that we will live through as we walk through the book of Exodus, and that freedom is the gospel that we proclaim in Jesus Christ. Amen. This Peace and Global Witness offering supports peacemaking and global witness efforts that address critical issues around the world and right at home. 25% of your offering will stay right here at Covenant to contribute to peace and reconciliation done by our mission partners. At the national and international level, the offering supports people like Salai. Salai grew up in a community in Fiji that was forced to relocate due to rising sea levels. Faith-based organizations like the Pacific Council of Churches are stepping in to support displaced communities through direct assistance, through government advocacy and public ed education about the devastating impact of the world's ecological crises. The Pacific Council of Churches understands this work as part of peacemaking, including addressing the growing mental health concerns that result from the impact of climate change. Program uh, coordinator Pre uh, Francis Namomu says that it is our calling both as a people and as Christians to take care of creation and our impact on this planet. It's not like peacemaking is some foreign flower that was introduced to us so that we can see the connection between us and the environment. It has always existed in our culture and traditions, Francis says. Francis continues, thank you. If it weren't for the funding we receive from the PCUSA, we would not be able to support communities like Salai's and to help sustain a livable world for her family and all future generations.